Beautiful. Very beautiful. That song reminded me, talking about the angels. I got a text this just a couple days ago. And the start of the text was, the angels are working. And I thought, wow, what is he gonna, what's the testimony here? What are these angels doing? And he said, I plugged them in, and they worked. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> That was Dan. <laughs> oh, well. They're working anyway, and they're beautiful. <laughs> but the angels are working still. <laughs> I forgot to mention that uh, we have in your bulletin a list of the police officers for you to pray through this list for these officers if you'd like to do that. But today I want to focus on families, the sacredness of families. We're going to have a dedication at the end of the service of a family to the Lord and... Uh, it's so beautiful. God made families. God made babies and children. My children all grown up, and I used to snuggle with them and hug them and kiss them, and you just can't do that with other people's kids. You know, they're only, so I'm waiting for the grandkids to come along to where I could do that again. I just love the kids. I love my family. We all love our families, don't we? And God did that. And uh, parenting changes. Somebody said, about your clothing for the mother. Your first child, as soon as you find out you're pregnant, you go out and you start wearing maternity clothes. Your second baby, you, you wait as long as you can until you wear the maternity clothes. The third child, your maternity clothes are your regular clothes. No, 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 you guys look great. You guys look great. <laughs> as far as worries, you know, the first baby, the, the first sign of a little whimper or a cry or something, you go and pick the baby up. The second baby, you, you wait to pick them up until they're sort of threatening the firstborn, then you pick them up. The third baby, you teach them how to, you know, rewind the mechanical swing, you know, that's what happens there. For the pacifier, you've heard all this, first baby, you, it drops on the ground, you bring it home, boil it until you give it back. Second baby, you take your, your juice thing and you, you know, squeeze it off and you put it back. Third one, you just like... <laughs> <laughs> Parenting changes, doesn't it? The diapering, the first baby, it's like, oh, yeah, it's clean, dry, you know, all that, every hour. Every... Second baby, maybe every two or three hours or when it's absolutely necessary. Third, third baby, you kind of hope nobody notices the smell and you see that sagging down, down to the knees. You know, it just changes. <laughs> at home, the first baby, you just gaze at the baby, so beautiful. The second baby, you just, you, you just hope that the, your second child doesn't, hurt the baby. The third child, you kind of hide from the kids. You know, you, no, no more gazing. So I want to talk about the sacredness of family, good, bad, and the ugly. Amen. And then dedicating a, a family to the Lord. So first of all, uh, a public de dedication acknowledges that children are a gift from God. The Bible says, behold, children are a gift of the Lord. You're a gift. You were a child once. <laughs> We're all a gift of God. He gave us this life as a gift. And it's so exciting when a ch new child enters into a family. And we want to recognize that in dedication, that this, these children are given to us by the Lord, and we've set aside some special time to recognize that in having a child dedication. The next slide. You know, every child is handmade, customized by God. It's really profound and beautiful. The Bible says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. So we recognize in the dedication that children are a gift from God, and secondly, that they belong to God. On this next slide, you kind of see giving the baby up to God. It, our children belong to God, but now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. And when we belong to him, he cares for his own. The passage goes on, when you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they'll not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you'll not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. So beautiful. 
And God, you know, we hear this, but it's true. He's a jealous God. In the Ten Commandments, he says, you'll have no other gods before you. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. So there's an... Our, as parents raising children, we advantage them or we can disadvantage them depending on how we raise them and if we put in their hearts to walk with the Lord and to love, to love the Lord. So our children are a gift from God. They belong to God. And thirdly, we have a role as parents and dedication kind of brings this out. Mary and Joseph dedicated Jesus in the temple when he was a child. And people brought their children to Jesus. And that's what we model after. The scripture says, and they, the parents, were bringing children to him, Jesus, so that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked them. He said, no, God doesn't care about the kids, just, just adults. Jesus rebuked them. And when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, permit the children to come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it at all. And he took them in his arms. I love this picture. He took them in his arms and he began blessing them, laying his hands upon them. That's a picture of the dedication that we're doing. Scripture says for fathers to bring up their children in the training and the instruction of the Lord. The very best thing we could do for our children, the very best thing, is to lead them in following Christ. And then lastly, dedication acknowledges that others stand with us. Parenting is hard. Children, beautiful as they are, can be a challenge. And it takes a community around us. It takes a congregation, a church. It takes the grandparents and the siblings and the, the community, friends and family. Because when the child grows, if they are attached to other people, good voices in their life, when they get up into those teenage years, when they start to emerge from their parents' faith, you see, when they're children, they just do what mom and dad says. But when they get up into their teenage years, they start to say, wait a minute. What's going on here? And they start to think for themselves. And at that time, we want relationships with other people of faith that have a voice in that child, in that teenager's uh, heart and life. It's very valuable. So we have a youth pastor, children's pastor. We have a children's church and a youth group. And so there's another voice besides the parent to hold them steady when the, when the storms are blowing. Let me take a few minutes and talk to you about the sacredness of families. The, I put a long passage there. I won't read that, but it says basically that God made man. He created us. We're his. Then he made a woman and brought him to the man, and that was the first marriage. God made marriage, and then they had kids, and he wants them to have kids to multiply, he said. That's what that passage says. So first of all, family is sacred, and sacred means uh, that God designed it for his purpose. God has a purpose for your life, and he has a purpose for your family. He designed families with a purpose. And so family is sacred. Secondly, family is safe. You start messing with those kids, watch out for mama bear. She's coming for you. Seriously. The family is very, a very serious thing, and it's a safe place. They say blood is thicker than water. Uh, many of you here today prove that. You are here not because you felt like coming to this church today. As a matter of fact, it might even be a little uncomfortable. You're not used to this. It's a different style, whatever. I don't know. But you came here because blood is thicker than water, and you came to stand by this family. And it's a beautiful thing. I grew up uh, uh, in the Roman Catholic Church and the Russian Orthodox Church, mother, father, different churches. And uh, I remember the first time I, I stepped into a church like this. The pastor stood up with his electric guitar and started singing. And I'm like, 
can they do that? You know, <laughs> I, I was 24, but I grew up, and, and I just like didn't didn't venture out. It was cool, but the there was a, a a man there. His name was Billy. He was about 30, 35 years old, and he was mentally challenged, and he would disrupt the service a little bit. And I watched that pastor. He was so kind, and he was so loving. I said, you know, this is a good guy. And then I listened to him as he as he spoke the word, as he taught the Bible, I said, that's really what it says. That's good. And it ended up being a blessing in my life. And I hope today your, your guests are comfortable here and that uh, you feel God's love, you feel our love, and you're blessed by being here. Well, God's got a perfect design for raising kids. It's called family. Family protects, family nurtures, family provides, family cares for. And so socially, we go out to work, we go out to school, and then where do we come back to? Family. And we kick back. I love getting home after a long day, kicking back. It's my home, my family. I'm safe, I'm secure, I'm provided for. It's beautiful the way God did it. I grew up in Middlefield, not far from here. And I remember that first day going to kindergarten when my mother put me on the bus scary. I remember my heart, the way it felt, and I was so glad my mother was there for me. I remember I used to be an athlete. You'd never know it now. I, I used to swim on a swim team, and my father would come and cheer me on. That was really important to me. Family's important. My whole family was there for me at UConn when I graduated with an engineering degree in chemical engineering. They were there for me. I remember that. It's important. Family's awesome. God made family. So family's sacred, safe, and family is spiritual. We're designed to take care of our families, our children, our spouses, you know, the, the nurturing, the food, the housing, that clothing. But that's not all. We are also designed to care for our families spiritually, to follow God, to love God. So, like I said, my mom was a uh, Roman Catholic, and I used to go with her, devout. We went every week, and my brother and I, we were just about a year, a little over a year apart, we would fight under the pew. You know, we would, and she'd be like, shh, shh, shh. You know, and, and that's why we have a kids' church, by the way. If any of you are here, and you, you know, they just want to jump and play. They're at a different level. And, uh, and then she would promise us things. We're going to go to the bakery after this, and we're going to get something for you. Just, you know, be good. You know, I remember those years. And then I went with my dad on the holidays a lot of times, so, you ever go to a Russian Orthodox church? You stand, and it goes on and on. And I mean, I love Roman Catholic, okay, but on and on. As a kid, it was like, I didn't know which was worse. It was tough. It was tough, you know? You don't, you don't understand a lot of this, this stuff, but I am so grateful that my parents built in me a spiritual, they fostered spiritual things in me, and that's what families need to do is not just pay attention to the food and the clothing, but also the spiritual side of life. And dedication today is about valuing the spiritual part of the families. So you may be asking, well, what, what happened? You know, uh, how'd you get here? <laughs> and for me, I went to Xavier High School, and about my junior year, I, I just, it wasn't, it wasn't there. I mean, I wasn't receiving, there was... I couldn't, I wasn't getting it, so, so I lost interest, and I did nothing for quite a while. Graduated UConn, went to work for Dow Chemical, and a couple years into it, a friend of mine called me up from Texas. He happened to be an engineer I went to school with, and he's talking about Jesus and the Bible and church, and I'm like, really? Are you losing it? Are you having a fight with your girlfriend? What is wrong with you, you know? But he came up, and he started sharing the word with me, and you know, it came to the point, he, he left, uh, he, he gave me a, a piece of paper that was a, it talked about an old man that fell asleep, and he had a dream that he, he, he was before the Lord, and they traced the footsteps of his life. And th there were the valleys where there was one set of footsteps, and the mountaintops where there were two, and he turned to the Lord, and he said, why on the mountaintops were you walking with me? There's two sets of footsteps. And why in the valley did you leave me alone when there's only one set of footsteps? And, he, and the Lord turned to him and said, because in the valley I was carrying you. And I 
can't make explanation, but in that moment, I said, you jerk. You thought you were doing all this success. I had plenty of money. I was living in a lakefront home. I had plenty of stuff. It was, you thought it was you all this time. It was God that was lifting you up and carrying you and helping you. And at that moment, everything became personal. I, I realized that I had sinned against God personally. And all of a sudden, I'm like, wow. And Jesus became very real to me. And I went to my knees, and I remember crying, and I remember Jesus forgiving me. And I was never the, the same since. And then I walked into that little church where that pastor stood up with his guitar, and that's where that story went. But just to, to explain that a little bit. But family is sacred, family is safe, family is spiritual, and family is a steward of the family. You know, conceiving is fun. It's short. It's easy. No problem. But, you know, bearing children is a little harder, I understand. And uh, so that whole part is fairly short. And so I think husbands, can we turn to our, our, the mother of our children and just say thank you? You see, we get the fun part. Well, There's no problem for us. So thank you for bearing my, thank you for bearing my children. That's kind of the tougher part than what we do as husbands, isn't it? In the conceiving part, Kathy and I uh, were traveling internationally and we were flying on Swiss Air over to Slovakia to do the national uh, youth convention over there to speak for that. And we had been married a year and we clasped hands because we felt it was time. Okay, Lord, let your will be done. We're ready to start a family. From Adam until now, God's perfect design, God's beautiful design, has been one woman, one man, married for life, bearing children. That's his perfect, his ideal plan. But technology, our own fallenness, our own brokenness, you know, we deviate from that plan, obviously. But that still remains his perfect plan that an extremely exclusive commitment to two people called marriage has the privilege and is allowed to have this wonderful physical intimacy that bears this unique child that represents both parents. It's tremendous the way God did it. That's how I shared the birds and the bees with my kids when they were young, when they were little. We would say, Mommy and Daddy love each other, and between the two of us, look at you got Mommy's nose, you got, you got all the good stuff from me, and whenever there's a problem, it was her side of the family. You understand <laughs> the, way, the way I taught them. <laughs> and you're going to see when we bring this family up, and you're going to see these kids, and what are you going to do? You're going to look at the kids, and you're going to go, Oh, that looks like him, that looks like her. That's it. It's beautiful the way God did it. But the fact is, child conception and bearing is kind of the easy part compared to the rearing of 18 years, basically. Oh, really, your whole life. It never ends, I'm finding. <laughs> Amen. A few weeks ago, I married my oldest daughter. I walked her down the aisle, and I stood in front of her, and I did the service. And I talked to her in that service. You see, I was traveling internationally, and when she was born, I changed my life. I got off the road and I settled down and I came to this church because I wanted to be there as a father for my daughter every night and every morning. And I told her at that wedding that I did that for her because I loved her and she knew it was true. It's easy to father a child, but it's really hard to be a father who's there for that child, standing by that child, loving their mother really hard. Nonetheless, that's how God wants it. He optimized the relationship called marriage for that purpose. That's his design. There's no better way. Families are sacred and they're safe and they're spiritual and they're a steward of those children. So when the conception part comes, it's easy to say, oh, I love you, you're beautiful, you're wonderful. But when the diapers are there, we're not yelling at each other, oh, I love you, this is wonderful, you know, that kind of thing. It gets harder, but it's still part of family life, a very important part. And we don't want to lose sight in all that busyness, in all that sometimes difficulty and challenge. There is one thing that is the primary thing, that is the most important thing in our families. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus while Martha worked. 
And Jesus told her this, but the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you're worried about and bothered about so many things, but only a few things are necessary. Really, only one. One thing. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away. There's really one thing that's important, and that is that we follow Christ, that our children follow Christ. There was a rich man Jesus told us about. He said this rich man was wearing really great clothes and had a great life. Then he died and he went up and there was a great chasm and he was in hell, this kind of torment. And this is what happened. Then I beg you, he cried out, then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house for I have five brothers. You see, he cared about his family, but it was then too late that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. You see, Jesus is saying, what matters most? With all the clothing and all the housing and all the schooling and all that, what matters most is the one thing, and that's to follow Jesus. Now's the time, because life's short. When they're young, it's beautiful. So God's assignment to parents is to live that life and to lead that life. So next slide. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. That's to the parents. We don't send our kids. We bring our kids. And these words, you shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You see, we started out with a bang. We started out with twins. Try it. It's a blast. And we almost lost my wife in the child bearing. So she was down. She had that helps kind of thing. And I had the twins, and we had just taken this church, and I almost lost my mind. I got to tell you, no, for real. I mean, I felt like I was hallucinating, you know what I mean? I mean, no sleep. It, it's hard. And you could show me all the Hollywood beauties you want. You could show me men, millionaires, billionaires racing with these beautiful big cars. But what I want to see is a woman who sacrificed for her children. I'll praise her. You show me a man who got up every morning and went to work and brought home the paycheck and loved the mother and stood by those kids. I'll honor that man. That's the people I are my heroes. That's what dedication is all about. Right at the beginning of life for these children, that we stand up and say, as for me and my house, we will follow the Lord. We will serve the Lord. We're following the example of Jesus' family, if you'd put up the next slide. Mary and Joseph brought their baby Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem in order to dedicate him to the Lord. That's what we're doing today. Parents make this decision. We're, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. They make this decision, and they make this declaration just like Mary and Joseph. And some parents might say, well, wait a minute now. Can't the kids make up their own mind? Okay, I'll go with you, as long as you're not a hypocrite, as long as you're consistent. If you're going to let them make up their own mind as far as school goes. Do you want to go to school today? No, I don't want to go. I want to sleep in. Okay. Uh, what do you want to eat today? Oh, I want to eat uh, Twinkies. Okay. We don't let them do that. We love our kids. We get them to school. Get up, I said already. Well, we'll get older. You'll do it. <laughs> we feed them good food. Uh, we don't let them play when we want, they want. We don't let them sleep when they, all that they want. We, we help them. Same spiritually. Families do the one thing, most important thing, is to make sure, as, as sure as they're on the bus, you make sure they're sitting in this church on Sundays and midweeks to raise them up in the Lord. Because we need help. Parents, you, you send your kids to school because you're not a school teacher. You send your kid to doctors because you're not a doctor. You send your kid to a dentist because it's miserable. Let them do it. Right? Same with church. We do it together because we need help, even in the spiritual way. I'll never forget my mom. She, she loved me. She, she stopped working to raise me, and that's sometimes not possible. I understand that. And... Um, my dad was an electrician. He was always faithful to my mom. And I had a good upbringing, and I am thankful for that. And you might be looking at me saying, great for you, Pastor Scott. My life was messy. 
I didn't have that in my life. Well, I've got some very good news for you. Even when you do things right, sometimes it gets messy. Joseph had a mess on his hands. What would you say? You're pregnant to Mary? Uh, we didn't do anything yet. It was messy, but they did the right thing. And sometimes we don't even do the right thing. We do the wrong thing. And life gets very messy. One girl said she got pregnant from swimming in a local swimming pool. Uh, no. Nobody bought that. <laughs> And the answer when we mess up is not to lie, not to hide it. God has a way better solution than that. He does a great job with this. The Bible says if we say we have no sin, we're deceiving ourselves. The truth is not in us. We all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, me, me as much as anybody else. If we say that we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. We just admit it. We don't want to stay in the darkness. There's a way better way God made and sin hurts God's heart. And we don't want to do that. If we confess our sins, and this is all one passage I'm just reading through. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's the good news. And then it says, if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We admit we're wrong. We apologize for it. We turn to Jesus and we follow him. So if you and I have messed up in our marriage, any hands on that one? No, don't, no. If we've messed up in our parenting, any hands on that one? Yeah, really. If we've messed up as a child toward our parents or brothers, and you know, whatever it is. The Bible says this in Isaiah 54. He says, fear not, for you will not be put to shame. Neither feel humiliated, for you will not be disgraced, but you will forget the shame of your youth. You see, when you come to Christ, you're forgiven. For your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. For the God, for the God has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, says your God. We could get so down the wrong roads, mess up so much, but God has made a way for us. The devil wants to keep putting you down, but God wants to lift you up. I'm an engineer. When I designed things, I would design them to include operator error, operator hostility. When someone wanted to sabotage the equipment, I made sure they couldn't blow it up. I was in a chemical plant. They couldn't blow things up there. I had to make sure of that. God did the same thing. He's smarter than me. Amen? When God designed this world, he made sure that he was going to handle anything that went wrong. You think he was shocked the first time you had a marriage argument? The first time you failed at a parent? <gasps> As a parent? They can't be parents anymore. They failed this time. Huh. He was ready for it. Well, we were yet sinners. Christ died on the cross for us. He demonstrated his love to us while we were yet sinners. It's incredible. God knew things were going to blow up, things were going to get messy, and we were going to mess up. And he was prepared for that with a thing called grace. Grace. We can't earn it. It's a gift of God. We can't work it off, work off the... No, no such thing. He just forgives it. He removes our sins when we ask forgiveness. And so the scripture in Isaiah 61 says, instead of your shame you'll have a double portion. And instead of humiliation, they'll shout for joy over their portion. All the hurts and failures and pains that come out of marriage, and I'm talking to all of us here, parenting, family life in general, God's love wants to shine through. And our love should shine through to people who are struggling in these ways. We love people. The skin horse had lived longer in the nursery than any of the others. He was wise, for he had seen a long succession of mechanical toys arrive to boast and swagger and by and by break their mainsprings and pass away. And he knew that they were only toys and would never turn into anything else. For nursery magic is very strange and wonderful, and only those playthings that are old and wise and experienced like the skin horse understand all about it. What is real, asked the rabbit one day when they were lying side by side near the nursery fender. Does it mean having things that buzz inside you and a stick-out handle? Real isn't how you are made, said the skin horse. It's a thing that happens to you when a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, 
then you become real. Does it hurt? asked the rabbit. Sometimes, said the skin horse, for he was always truthful. When you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like being wound up, he asked, or bit by bit? Well, it doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become, you become, it takes a long time. That's why it doesn't often happen to people who break easily or have sharp edges or who have to be carefully kept. Generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off. And your, your eyes drop out and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. Amen? Amen? Amen, parents? <laughs> Grandparents, amen. <laughs> but these things don't matter at all. Because once you're real, you can't be ugly. Except to people who don't understand. That was the Velveteen Rabbit, as many of you know. That's kind of the way it is. We go through life loving, loving our children. It's a huge sacrifice, but it's good and it's right. And that's why we dedicate them and dedicate ourselves to the Lord. Moms and dads, you're beautiful. It's tough. But it's good. I told you I married my daughter a few weeks ago. And I posted afterward on Facebook. You could put up the picture of my daughter there. When what they do now, I guess, or what she did, was do first look. They call it first look. And uh, so when she's all ready, the dad, that would be me, gets the first look. You walk in and she's standing there and the bridesmaid are there and the, and the flower girls and all the, the whole thing. And there she stands. And she was just breathtaking after all those years. And I Facebooked this. I said, it's all worth it. In that moment, it's all worth it. All the years of love and care poured into her heart keeps pouring back into mine. It's worth it, guys. It's hard, but it's worth it. Dedication today is about raising these children next 18 years and beyond. Raising them in a way so they can be who God made them to be. A mother held her new baby and very slowly rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she held him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby, you'll be. The baby grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was two years old and he ran all around the house and he pulled all the books off the shelves. He pulled all the food out of the refrigerator and he took his mother's watch and flushed it down the toilet. Sometimes his mother would say, this kid is driving me crazy. But at nighttime... When that two-year-old was quiet, she opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor, looked up over the side of his bed, and if he was really asleep, she picked him up and rocked him back and forth and back and forth and back and forth while she rocked him. She sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, you're my baby, you'll be. The boy grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was nine years old and he never wanted to come in for dinner. He never wanted to take a bath. And when grandma visited, he always said bad words. <laughs> Sometimes his mother wanted to sell him to the zoo. But at nighttime, when he was asleep, the mother quietly opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor and looked up over the side of the bed. If he was really asleep, she picked up that nine-year-old boy and rocked him back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And while she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby, you'll be. The boy grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was a teenager. He had a, a, a strange friends, and he wore strange clothes, and he listens to strange music. Sometimes the mother felt like she was in the zoo. But at nighttime, when that teenager was asleep, the mother opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor, and looked up over the side of the bed. If he was really asleep, she picked up that great big boy and rocked him back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. While she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Well, that teenager grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was a grown-up man. He left home and got a house across town. But sometimes, on a dark night, the mother got into her car and drove across town. If all the lights in the son's house were out, she opened his bedroom window, crawled across the floor, and looked up over the side of the bed. If that great big man was really asleep, she picked him up and rocked him. 
and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. While she rocked him, she's saying, I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. As long as you're living, my baby, you'll be. Well, that mother, she got older. She got older and older and older. One day she called up her son and said, you'd better come and see me because I'm old and sick. So her son came to see her. When she came in the door, she tried to sing the song. She sang, I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. But she couldn't finish because she was too old and too sick. The son went to his mother. He picked her up. He rocked her back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And while he rocked her back and forth, he sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my mother you'll be. When the son came home that night, he stood for a long time at the top of the stairs. Then he went into the room where his very new baby daughter was sleeping. He picked her up in his arms and very slowly rocked her back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while he rocked her, he sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. You got to go get your kids. Sorry, I'm going to finish this. <laughs> Dedication says, as for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. That we're in this for the long haul. We're going to do this together through the most difficult days. And it's worth doing right. I get choked up with that because my mom is 88 now. And she can't come to church anymore. It's my turn to go over to her house. And hold her in my arms and sing to her. Because my mom, when I was little, taught me how to make sugar cookies. And I'll never forget it. I grabbed the pan when it was hot and I burned my hands. And she just loved me. We had so much fun together. My dad brought me trout fishing. And he let me cast first into this one hole and it was this massive trout and I caught him. And we cleaned him and we cooked him and we did it together. My dad's gone now, but my mom's still here. And I sing loud to her, and I sing loud to my children, and sometime soon, I hope, we're going to sing loud to our grandchildren. <laughs> I take this whole thing personal. This isn't just a ritual to me. This is so real. Would you love your children? Would you be there for them and raise them up? Be faithful to the, to the mom, to the dad. Create some memories and, and, and lead them to love Jesus. The one thing that's most important. And when your parents get older, would you sing over them? And as your children are growing up, would you sing over them? This is a picture of God. I want to read you one last scripture. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. Listen, he will rejoice over you with singing. You see, God sings over you. He loves you, and we're created in his image. So we sing, and I'm even saying it metaphorically, that we just, we just love others. I'll love you forever. Picture him singing over you. I'll like you for always. God, you can't love me. You can't like me. Look at what I've... No. I like you for always, as long as I'm living, and he's going to live forever. My baby, you'll be, well, always, steady. He takes it personal. And I think today we're going to have the dedication here in a minute. He doesn't want just this family dedicated. He wants all of us dedicated. You think so? He wants a fresh, new dedication of all of our lives to say, you know, Lord, I'm going to keep the one main thing, the main thing, because that's the main thing. I'm going to follow Jesus and keep him first. And in that, I am going to love my family. So, oh, look at this timing. I'm going to have these parents come right up. I'm going to move this a little bit to the side. 
Parents come right up and sponsors stand right behind them. Dad's got one and Mom's got one. So you kind of stand here front and center and the sponsors can stand behind you if we can do that so you're comfortable here. Nick and Jess, come on right up here. Okay, watch your step there. Yeah, just stand here and you stand behind him. That's great. You can kind of face me, I guess, because I'm going to be talking to you a little bit. You got enough room? Yeah, yeah, that's good. So, so let me talk to you parents first. Um, you've come. You want to dedicate yourselves to the Lord. Uh, you want to dedicate your children. You want these children to look back on this day and be proud of your actions, of what you did. As they remember this. And this is tape, Dan. Dan, this is film. So we've got a tape of this right now, the whole service. You keep and show it to them when they grow up so they'll be proud of you as parents for the investment you're making in them. And this is a serious commitment. So let me say this. Our children watch us and do what we do more than what we say. We all know that. To best ensure the eternal success of your children, will you personally love the Lord with your whole heart and model the Christian life for your children at home, work, in your marriage, and as parents so that your children may walk in the abundant life that Christ offers? Will you raise your children in a God-honoring way, providing a Christian home of love and peace, praying for your children, and remaining in partnership with the church, joining together to teach your children about Jesus, faithfully attending church with your child, and encouraging them to follow Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You can say, we do. Beautiful. Now, just for a moment, you grandparents, if you're the grandparents here, would you stand? Grandparents, great-grandparents, I'm very proud of you. Just stand right up. That's right. The Bible says in Proverbs, it declares how grandchildren are the crown of the aged. Don't take that personal. That's a compliment. That's good. That's good. And we know that you grandparents are very, very proud of your children and grandchildren, and they have a very special place in your hearts. And there's a great pride that comes with seeing another generation come in our families. And I'm going to keep this short because I see what's coming. <laughs> Standing with us are three generations. Thank you, grandparents. You could sit down there. And now for the sponsors, I have uh, Dustin and Maria Lunn right here, standing for Brady. And we're going to make it, Brady. Brady, you good? Yeah. And we have Frank Testa. Yeah. And uh, Michaela Melillo, standing for Nolan. And so you're standing because this family trusts you, they love you, they know you love their children, you, they know you love them, and it's, it's wonderful to see this family grow, and you're, you're kind of growing together with, with this. And so you're all here because they love you and trust you to help with their children. You each have a special place in their lives. To this end, will you help these parents raise their children, encourage them, praise them, assist them, uphold them in prayer and physical support uh, as you've discussed with them? You can say we do. Beautiful. And now I want to talk to you as the congregation to make a commitment to this family. The Bible commands us to tell of God's work to your children. Let your children tell it to their children and their children to the next generation. In Joel 1.3. Christian lifers, that's you guys, that's us. Will you, with God's help, receive this family into our Christian life spiritual family? Joining with them and raising their children to follow the Lord modeling Christ, working alongside them, and praying for them so that these children and all our children may learn to follow Christ and work in the abundant life that Christ offers. If you do, you can all together say, I do, or we do. Let's say we do. We do. All right, you're in. Now I'm going to do something very dangerous. I'm going to try to take Nolan in my arms. Nolan, easy now. Easy. There we go. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Can you see him over there? <laughs> now that's a baby. Isn't that beautiful? Now aren't you saying, oh, he looks like this or that, or <laughs> I better hurry up and pray before it gets away from me. You've dressed them so beautifully. You care for them so beautifully. Would, would you, um, I'm going to ask you to stand. And what we do is we just as a gesture of connection stretch our hand toward this family. And I'm going to, I'm going to bless them, pray for them. Would you do that as I do this? Father, thank you for your gift of children. 
for Christ's love for children and for these children. Lord, help this family and Christian Life Church join together in the joys and challenges of child raising. Help these parents to fulfill their loving commitment made today and to always remember that you love the children. Whoops. Uh oh. You want this? It's in the middle of the blessing. Okay. No? Okay, we'll give them a chance without it. Okay. Let me keep going. That each child belongs to you, Lord, and that raising children is a precious stewardship, a privilege and responsibility. May these children fulfill the assignments you have written for them and forever be with you in heaven. We thank you, Lord, for all that you will do in and through. Nice. Was that a yawner? Okay. Through his life. And now I dedicate you, Nolan and Brady, to the Lord. For the glory of God, to bless the name of the Lord all the days of your lives in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Worship team, you can get ready. Here you look, he did great. I'm so happy. You can sit down if you want. You can sit down, but couple, if you would stay up here, Jess and Nick. The first thing I want to give you, well, I want to congratulate you. But I want to give you a rose, a white rose for each one, the purity of the children. We believe children, should anything happen, go to be with the Lord. And the rose is a symbol. You can't force a rose to open or you'll destroy it. The only thing you can do is place that rose in the sunshine, in the soil, in the water, and where it belongs, and it will open in its time. The same with children. You place them in the place they need to be, and they will bloom and follow Christ in, in, in their time. Secondly, uh, we have a gift for you. Kathy, do you have? Oh, oh, you put them here. This is a gift of a Bible, and this is what we want you to stand on and teach them to stand on in the storms of life, to know Jesus, to follow Jesus. You get that? All right. And uh, that's a little kid's Bible, so as you, it's got pictures and all this cool stuff. And then I have a certificate. Oh, boy. Huh? Can you do it? Moms could do anything. Amen, everybody? <laughs> and after the service, we have cake and, in the, and other things, some finger foods. In, if you just go down this hallway into the double doors and just... Just spend some time together. I guess you could sit down. Yeah, yeah, that's great. We're going to do one more song, and then uh, I'll come back. I'll come back and dismiss us, I think. Would you stand with us? What hope we hold this starlit night our king is born in Bethlehem our journey long we seek the light that leads to the hollow in manger ground what fear we felt in the silent age 400 years can he be found but broken by a baby's cry rejoice in the hollow in manger ground Amen crown of thorns would pierce his brow and we beheld this offering exalted now the king of kings praise God for the hollow in manger
Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, thank you. We go out of here today rejoicing in your goodness, rejoicing in the babe that was born in the manger, Lord, and still we celebrate children. Thank you for Nick and Jessica, for Brady and Nolan and the family and all the family members they have to support them. Bless them, we pray. And bless the food and our time together after this service. For it's in Christ's name we pray.